Hey, this is so exciting. We uh, are very, very honored to be here today. And my wife Val and I uh, love coming to Staten Island. And uh, so it is very exciting uh, to be able to be here. And I just want to thank uh, Pastor Ray for giving me the opportunity to come and to be able to, uh, uh, to share God's Word today uh, from this pulpit. I know that he rarely gives it up. And so, uh, <clears throat> so it is... Uh, uh, really a treat and an honor uh, to be able to be here with you and to be able to share with you. Now, you have already figured out, I mean, you knew it already, but uh, after listening to me for two minutes, you realize I am not from around here, right? And uh, so, uh, so yeah, I, I grew up, was raised, born, raised in the South. I am a Georgia boy, and this voice comes naturally, man. I, I don't even have to work at this accent, all right? It's just natural. And so, uh, if nothing else, I hope that entertains you, all right? So, uh, uh, so, it takes me a while to even say my name, all right? So, uh, my name is Ken. <laughs> and so, uh, so, you know, it's funny. Whenever you, uh, whenever you speak in a different location, a different part of the country, you always want to be effective, you know? And, and you know, it's funny because... Everybody in, in our neck of the woods talks like me. And so whenever a guy like Pastor Ray comes down and he preaches, everybody gets excited, right? <laughs> everybody thinks it's so cute that he has this really thick Italian New York accent, you know? And everybody loves it when he leaves. And so I, I think, well, when I come here, does the same thing happen here? You are very gracious, because <laughs> I know it doesn't happen. Nobody, nobody goes home and says, boy, I wish I'd talk like that. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, it's really an honor to be here. In fact, uh, you know, you, any, anytime you speak somewhere, you know, the truth is, as you, you really do, you want to, you know, I'll put it this way, it doesn't matter where, where you're at, whenever you communicate God's Word, you want it to be effective, Right? I mean, because it's, it's the power of life, right? You want to be effective. And so, so sometimes, when I, sometimes when I get opportunities to speak in other places, I, I feel like the story of this guy, this is really corny, by the way, <clears throat> uh, but I feel like this guy who, uh, his wife, he lived in Denver, Colorado, and his wife was on vacation over uh, in Italy. And so right before she came home, he, he called her on the phone and and, and he was just going to check in with her. She was going to check, check on things at home. And so, you know, he said, hey, how are you? How's it going? And she said, it's great. They talked for a little while. And then she says, oh, by the way, how's my cat? And he said, oh, your cat died. And, and she said, what? What? What do, you, what do you mean my cat? She said, do you not have any idea? You never, when somebody's away, like, you never tell them just like that. You're never so blunt. You never just say, your cat died. And, and she said, you have no idea. You've just ruined my trip. She said, you just made, this is miserable. I'm, I'm, I don't even know if I want to come home. She said, you never say it. He said, I'm so sorry. I, I, don't, I, I, I don't know the protocol. I have no idea how you're supposed to say that. And she said, she said well, here's what you should have done. She said, you should have just said when, I was, when you called, she said, your cat got on the roof. And, and then when I got to Europe, and, and I was changing planes, and, and I called. You should have said, uh, your cat got in a tree. And, and, and then when I got to New York, you should have said, your cat fell. I took it to the vet. And then when I got to Denver and you saw me in the airport, you should embrace me in your arms and say, your cat died, honey. I'm so sorry to tell you that. And so he said, well, I, I'm sorry. He said, I, I had no idea. I had no, what, I had no idea what to do. And so they talked for a minute, and then she said, so... So how's mom? <laughs> Y'all heard this already? <laughs> She's on the roof. <laughs> so <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm working really, really hard <laughs> at how to communicate more effectively and, uh, and uh, still working at it. So... Uh, I hope you uh, brought your Bibles. If you did, I want you to turn to the book of Acts. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. I uh, believe you guys just started a series uh, last week. And this is kind of your theme 
uh, kind of your go-to passage, which is uh, a go-to passage uh, in uh, our church for sure, and hopefully uh, always is here in your church. Now, I also uh, hope you have an outline. Do you have an outline in your, in your bulletin somewhere? Okay. So, so if you have your outline, here's what I want you to do. I want to start. Uh, there's a blank at the very top of your page, and I want to start by having you fill in this blank. In fact, uh, this is going to really set the stage for everything else we're going to talk about today. And so here is the, uh, here's the blank that I want you to fill in. Your top of your page, it says this, you are not created to live life, anybody know? Alone. Exactly right. You are not created to live life alone. Now, if I am effective in my communication today, here's what I hope happens. Is that if you are not yet living your life in a pathway to community, that by the time we live here today, that you will be willing to not just hear something, but you will be willing to do something different about not living life alone. You are not created... When God created mankind, when God created you, He had no, ne- never ever was it in His mind that you were supposed to go through this life, the storms of this life, the trials of this life, the joys of this life, the good times and the bad times. Never ever in God's equation and in God's design for your life were you ever created and meant to do or live your life alone. You are created to live your life in the context of community. In the context of community. You say, but, I, but, but, but you don't understand. I, I'm, I'm married and i got a family and, and, I, and I, my, my parents are around and my siblings. And I, Listen, that is exactly a part of God's plan for you to have community, but it does not stop with your family. It starts with your family, but it doesn't start, stop with your family. You see, if all you ever do is live your life in the community and the context of your family relationships, then you still miss out on a big part of what God's ultimate plan is for your life. Because God has called us to not only live in family or biological relationships. Here it is, listen. He's not only created you, to live in biological relationships, He's also created you to live in spiritual relationships. And this is very different. Now, uh, I share that with you because here's why. Because the pathway that you take in your life will always determine where you end up in your life. Everybody agree with that? So true, right? I mean, you know what? Life is filled with paths. There, 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 there are many, many different paths that you can take in life. And, and it is important that you really give, that you give some serious thought to whatever pathway that you're taking. And, it be, and because whatever path you take is going to determine where you end up in your life. You take the right path, you end up in the right place. You take the wrong path, you end up in the wrong place. And so, uh, last week, uh, Pastor Ray began a series Pathways, right? It's called pathways. And, and so what we're doing is we're, is it we're, we're, we're trying to identify what are, are those important pathways on your life to, to get you to the right end, end result, to the, get you to the right destination. And I, and I heard a story years ago. It's, a, uh, it's, a, it's just kind of a great little story. Uh, I heard a story about a missionary who was uh, actually uh, working with a uh, a, a very primitive group of people and still lived in sort of thatch huts and that kind of thing. And, and, and he had sort of immersed himself in this community of people. And, and, and what was interesting is that they had developed a, a very unique, um, a very unique co- uh, custom. And so uh, the way they lived in this little primitive village is that all of their huts and all their houses were sort of uh, for really for protection. They were they were built in a, in a circle. And then, here's what happened is, is that in each one of those huts, is that they would cut a path, they would cut a trail out into the jungle behind their house, behind their hut. 
And, and the reason they would do this is because that is where they would use that path, they would use that trail to go just out into the edge of the jungle to meet with God. So that's where they would have their quiet time. That's where they would have their, their time alone with God. And, and so over time, this missionary began to realize that he could, he could, he could ask somebody, he could identify how a person was doing in their relationship with God by simply asking this question, is your path still clear? That's great, isn't it? Is your path still clear? Because here's what happened. Because if you don't keep walking down that path, pretty soon what will happen to it? It'll grow up, won't it? It'll grow over. All of a sudden, weeds start growing. And, and over time, if you don't keep walking on that path, what will happen? That path will disappear. path will disappear. So, today, here's the question. The question is, how clear is your path? How clear is your path to community, to, to something that you've created to experience, to something that you're created to have, to live in. And, and so we're going to kind of wrestle this whole idea down is why do we need this pathway in our lives? Uh, without question, living in the context of life-giving relationships, life-giving community is a part of God's perfect plan for your life. And, and so some questions that I would ask you today as we begin to think about this is, is do you have that kind of path in your life? If, if not, I will tell you this, that is not going to take you to the destination that God has intended for you to experience in your life. And so I would ask you this, do you have, do you, do you have as a priority in your life, do you have life-giving relationships? Now, now I, I will confess to you that not all relationships are life-giving, right? Some of them are life-sucking, right? <laughs> I mean, they suck the life out of you, right? <laughs> God has a plan for that too. <laughs> he does. Because God has a plan for you to have those relationships in your life as well. And, and, and so I would ask you this, are, are, are you surrounded and are you living is there a place in your life where on a regular basis where you are surrounded by people that are helping to shape you into the person that God wants you to be? Because you're not meant to live a life alone. And, and so I, you need to ask yourself right now before we get any further, you know, is, is, is community for me, is it something that I just do whenever it's convenient? Is it something that I do whenever it's comfortable? Is it something that I do whenever I don't have time when I, when I when I have time for it and I have anything else in the way? Or is it something that is a priority in your life that you're going to make happen in your life? You know, there there are people that go to the gym that work out that won't let anything else get in the way. That's the way it ought to be for you in community. You shouldn't let anything else get in the way. You need to live in community. God has created you for that. You say, well, Ken, how do you know that? How, how, what is your basis for that? Because that is exactly what we see in the very first expression of community ever recorded in the Bible. We see it in Acts chapter 2. Let's read it together. In Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 42, let me make sure you understand what's happened here. At this point, Jesus is where? He's in heaven. He's already been risen from the dead. He's already ascended back to heaven. And uh, the day of Pentecost has just occurred and Peter has preached. The Holy Spirit has come. And, and the Bible says that on the very first day of the church, 3,000 people got saved. That's a very big membership class, isn't it? That's a lot of new Christians right there. Now, here's what they do. So they start to organize. And this organization is called the church. The very first Christian community called the church. And here's what it says. And they devoted themselves, verse 42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And all came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed 
were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to any to all who had need. Uh, to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking food uh, uh, and breaking bread in their homes, they received food and they with glad and generous hearts and praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So what we just read here is actually the very first, outside of Jesus and His disciples, this is the very first written record that we have of Christian community. Of believers in Jesus Christ, Christians gathering together, and gathered for what? To study God's Word, to study the Scripture, to study actually to study the teachings of Christ because that's the apostles' teaching. They gather together for the breaking of bread. They gather together for fellowship. They gather together for prayer. Now, a question that that I would want to ask you today is this. Do you have that same type of community in your life? Do you have that same type of community as a priority in your life? And and then another question that I would ask you is this. Where do you think they got that idea? Where do you think they, I mean, I mean, I mean, let's think about this. So, so there's brand new believers. There's, there's over 3,000 of them that are gathered together. And, and some, for some reason, somehow, they came up with this idea that, that we ought to meet together. And we ought to meet every now and then in the temple court. And then we also ought to meet from house to house and pray together, and fellowship together, and break bread together, and study the Word together, and give to each other, and love on each other, and serve each other. It's amazing, isn't it? So here's the question. Where did they get that idea? Where in the world did they come up with that idea? I mean, you think they were just sitting around one day and said, hey, we don't have anything else to do. Let's all meet at the temple court today. We don't have anything going on tonight. I mean, the Giants aren't playing. Let's all go over and watch, you know. Let's go over to so-and-so's house. No, that's not how they came up with that idea. You know how they came up with the idea to do this? They, the leaders of the movement had just been doing it for the last three years. Guess who they'd been with? Jesus. Listen to what it says in Mark chapter 3. Verse 14, Mark chapter 3, verse 14, it says this, and he, he being who? Jesus, appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, and here it is, so that they might be, two words, what is it? With him. So that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to what? So this is incredible. Think about this. So the place, the way they got this idea of doing life together, of living in community, of meeting from house to house, and meeting, the way they got this idea is that they understood, they learned that you're never to do life alone because they had been doing life with Jesus Himself. And He taught them the pathway to communion. And now they were just doing what they had already seen done. You see, this is one of the most, listen to this, you've got to listen. This is one of the most incredible things that you'll ever consider out of the Scripture. Is that Jesus took a handful of men, a handful of men and a few women were at it, actually with them, took a handful of men and women, and He literally turned the world upside down, did He not? In fact, you know how we know that? Because 2,000 years later and several thousand miles away, we are sitting in this room right here, right now in 2017, talking about how he did it. Now, he had pretty good results, if you ask me. So, so, so think about this. So he, listen to this, he turned the world upside down with a handful of men, a handful of women, and here's what he did. 
is it because He changed them through a pathway of community. They in turn, they in turn change the world. So here's the key question. Can it happen again? Where does it start? You got it. It starts right here. You say, oh, okay, okay. So, so you're really preaching to the guy over there. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm really preaching to you. I'm really preaching to you. If you're not in community, I'm preaching to you. It's God's plan. Never intended for you to do life alone. So, what we could do today, what you could do in Staten Island, is that you could create what I like to call with him communities. With him communities. You say, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Ken, you're, 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 if you've, have you lost your mind? Because he's not here. Oh, he's not? Oh, I, oh I, 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 I beg to disagree. In fact, it's actually better that he's not here because if he was here, he could only be with what? A few of us at one time. But because his Holy Spirit is here, guess what? He can be with everybody all the time. You see, that was his plan all along, wasn't it? You see, he, didn't, he, didn't, he hasn't left you alone. He actually has provided a counsel to be with you everywhere you go. And so, so here's what you can do is you can have with him communities everywhere you go because you've got the word of God and you've got the spirit of God and you've got the people of God. And whenever you have those three things together, if you're open to, open to what he wants to do in your life, is it those three things, the word of God, the spirit of God, the people of God can transform you into the image of the son of God. Same thing can happen today that happened 2,000 years ago. If. You're on the right pathway. <laughs> so, what does that look like? What does it look like? Why? Why do we need to be? You're probably thinking, you know, why do I need to be in a pathway uh, to community? Well, I want to give you some reasons why. And, and we're just going to walk through uh, some of what Jesus did. The first thing I want you to see is this. You can write this on your outline. Is that being with Him, listen to this, being with Him provided an opportunity to change them. Being with Him provided an opportunity to change them. Now, now you say, what does that mean? What, what it means is this, is that Jesus understood the power of example in the context of community. Does everybody understand what I mean by that? Uh, another way of saying it is this, is that Jesus understood the power of modeling in the context of community. How many of you know this? Is that we become like the people that we surround ourselves with. Isn't it true? Now, honestly, I could probably just stop right here. We could all go home and have enough to chew on right here, right? But then you'd feel shortchanged. <laughs> so, so, so what does that mean? That... that that with Him provided an opportunity to change them. Well, here, here's what happened. Is that Jesus understood, Jesus understood and applied one of the most important principles, one of the most important adages in all of education. Before I was a preacher, before I was a pastor, I was a teacher. I went to school at Georgia State University. I got a bachelor's degree in education. In the very first, in the very first education class I ever took at the university level, I had a professor, I had a teacher in there who said this. She said, she said, do not ever forget the most important principle in all of education is simply this. More is always caught than taught. I said, my grandmama told me that. Paid all this money to hear you say that? Could have gone to Granny's house and had it. How many of you know that's exactly what Jesus did? More, this is an old Southern thing, <laughs> more is always what? Caught than taught. More is always caught than taught. You see, 
Jesus understood. Jesus knew that people become like the people they spend the most time with. And so here's what he did. He spent three years walking with his disciples, talking with his disciples, hanging out with his disciples, doing ministry with his disciples. He spent three years. Why? So that they would catch what he was. So that being with him provided an opportunity to change them. You see, here's what they did. Over three years is that they began to to pattern their lives after his character and his conduct. Isn't it what Paul says? Paul says we need to be imitators of what? Christ. We need to follow his example as he follows Christ. Powerful. The reason that we need to be in with him communities is because it is a place where we are transformed. It is a place where we are changed. Think about this. One of the most incredible things that happened between Jesus and his disciples is that Jesus would go away Every morning almost, he would go away and pray. And he would come back and he would do miracles. He would go away and pray. He would come back. He would teach truth. He would go away and pray. So the disciples are watching this. And eventually, in Luke chapter 11, verse 1, guess what they asked Jesus to do? Teach us to pray. (laughs) Imagine that. Jesus didn't have to say, okay, boys. Today's lessons on how to pray. No, guess what happened? He prayed, and then they eventually said what? Teach us how to do this. So here's what you need. Is that we just need with Him communities that you're a part of, that's a path that you're on, because the path that you take determines the destination that you end up on. You know, here's the funniest thing. You ever remember this time? I mean, you've got to be a certain age to appreciate this, but... Uh, but I think most of you qualify. <clears throat> and uh, you ever remember? Do you remember the very first time you catch yourself doing something your parents do? That's scary, isn't it? You go, oh no, <laughs> I'm doing what they did all the time. I remember the first time. My father, great man, still alive, 87 years old. I his whole life he smacks his teeth. You know what I'm saying? Smacks his teeth like that. I'm sitting in a restaurant one day and I'm going, oh no. (laughs) It has happened to me. (laughs) Wouldn't it be cool if you caught yourself being like Christ someday? Caught yourself loving somebody someday. Caught yourself taking up a towel, washing somebody's feet someday. Just because you've been with him. You know what's funny? I may have shared this before. I don't know if I've shared this or not. You know, it's funny when people have been married together for a very long time. And you know what I mean by long time? 30 years is not a long time. We're talking 50, 60 years. People, I mean, this, people have been, this is true. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna, you're gonna think I'm crazy. This is true. When people have been married for 40, 50, 60 years, you know what happens to them? They start to look like each other. That's the truth, man. And you know what's funny? If they have a dog, the dog starts to look like them too. That's true, man. That's true. I'm telling you, it's so true. So here's what should happen. If you're on the right pathway, if you're on the right pathway, the longer you walk with Jesus, the more you ought to look like Jesus. And if you've got a whole community of people called Crossroads Church of Staten Island that are living like Jesus, then you're not going to have enough room for everybody. You're not going to have enough room for everybody. Because people are going to want to be a part of that. This is incredible. You know what? In, in, in Mark 3.14, he says he appointed 12 to be exact so they might be with him. That he might say. But listen to what it says in Acts 4.13. In Acts 4.13, it says this. It says, and now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. They were amazed because they had been with who? That's cool, right? Second thing I want you to see is this. 
is that they, um, being with him, created an environment to care for them. Being with him created an environment to care for them. Guys, listen to me. Jesus loved his disciples. And he created a context of community so that he could give them something he couldn't give to a crowd. You see, there's a reason why he changed the world through a small group. Because he could do something in a small group he couldn't give to a large group. Guess what that was? It was called relationship. You know, in, in, in John chapter 17, verse 9, listen to what Jesus says in his uh, high priestly prayer. He says, I am praying for them. Who is the them? His disciples. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those that you have given me, for they are yours. Now, the reason I share that verse with you is because it simply expresses the level of care that Christ had for His disciples. He, he cared enough about them to be able to pray for them. Now, how many of you know that it is very hard to express the same level of care for a large group that it is for a small group? You see, here's what I can tell you. If, just these tr- t- first two, if we just hung out every week right here, these first two rows, guess what? I could know exactly what to pray for in your life. I I could know. If you shared it with me, I could know. It's impossible for me to know the prayer request of everybody in this room. So there's a principle here. Is that as the church gets larger, it must also get what? Smaller. So if all you're a part of is this large crowd that meets on a Sunday, and you're not a part of a small group, you're not on the right pathway. You're on part of the right pathway you're not on all of the right pathway. You see, you may have heard this before, but this is so true, is that Jesus made disciples in circles, not rows. You know what you have in here, right? How are these chairs set up? In rows. You know, there's a reason we don't have a, there's a reason it's not one big huge circle. <laughs> because if we had one big huge circle, we we. We, we couldn't even hear each other. We couldn't even communicate. But when you go to somebody's house for a small group, you don't walk in and there be rows. What are they? Circles. The reason that Jesus created this environment is because He impressed the crowds of 5,000 when He fed them you know, with a handful of loaves and fish. But He impacted the world when He met with a handful of guys in a small group. You see, there's two levels of community. There's a temple court, there's a large group, but then there's a house to house, there's a small group. The difference is this, is that if all you're ever a part of is a large group, then all you ever see is the back of somebody's head. And you just know that somebody's getting bald, is all you ever notice. But when you're in a small group, you don't see the back of their head, you see them what? Face to face. And that's how you learn to care for somebody. I heard a great story about a guy who had a dream one night. And in his dream, an angel took him to hell and took him to heaven. So the first thing, the angel took him in this dream, he took him to hell. And when he got to hell, he noticed that in hell, there was this big huge bowl of stew. And people were seated around this bowl of stew. And they all were famished. They were all starving to death. They were all in anguish. They were all emaciated. They were miserable. They were crying. They were upset. They were starving to death. They all had a wooden spoon. But the spoon was so long that they couldn't dip the the stew and, and feed themselves. And they were miserable. And then the angel took him to heaven. And when he got to heaven, he goes into heaven, guess what he sees? He sees a big bowl of stew. And people seated all around it. Everybody's happy. Everybody's full. Everybody's everybody's great. Everybody's having a great time. Everybody's got a long wooden spoon. Too long to be able to dip the stew and to feed themselves. 
The guy said to the angel, he said, what is the, it's the same thing, but they're different. Their people are different. He said, what's the difference? He said, in heaven, they've learned how to feed each other. Learn how to feed each other. You know why you go to, why you get in community, why you find the path? It's not just for you. Somebody else needs what you have. Somebody else needs to be in your community. You see, I'll be honest with you. If the only reason you go to community is for you, that's a very selfish reason. You need to be in community, not just for what you get, but also for what you can give. The third thing I want you to see is that he, was, he wanted them to be with him because it developed a platform for him to coach them. It, it, prevented, it prevent, provided, developed a platform. You see, here's what you got to understand. Is that Jesus was the best discipleship coach in history. I mean, you, imagine being in his discipleship group. Imagine being in his small community. Imagine that. You see, I, I love, here's what I love. I love the idea of Jesus as a coach. Because it indicates that he not only wanted them uh, he not only told them what to do, but guess what? He showed them what to do. You know, for some of you guys that are my age, you will remember this. They don't do this anymore, but years ago, there was actually a, a role in the NFL that some teams had called a player coach. Anybody remember that? They actually had, they actually had NFL players that still were in good enough shape to play and yet they were a veteran enough that they could help be a coach. They were a player coach. And, and, and the reason they did that is because it gave them an op. They, they had a lot of information, but they also had a lot of application. And that's exactly what Jesus did. You see, Jesus didn't just tell them what to do. He also what? Showed them what to do. You see, for Jesus, it was like this. Jesus gave them a lecture and laboratory at the same time. Jesus gave them both. You know, very first thing that Jesus called His disciples to be was what? Fishers of... And then guess what He did? He took them fishing. You know, you see, a lot of times we think, well, okay, so, so I've been told that I need to be a fisher of men, but the only way you learn how to fish is by what? Fishing. So Jesus said, be fishers of men, and then, he was at a place called Matthew's house. And there's a very little subtle word in there that says, a, a phrase in there that says, and his disciples were with him. Why is that? Because he was giving them a laboratory and a lecture at the same time. You see, there's something that can happen in a small group community that doesn't happen in a large group. You see, here's what happens here. When you're in a large group, you just sit here and listen to somebody else talk. But when you are in a small group and you're doing ministry together and you're doing life together and you're serving together and you're taking trips to help hurricane victims together, you're learning something you won't learn sitting in a chair. You know, you ever thought about this? So you, you guys, does anybody here know how to water ski? Anybody know how to water ski? Anybody here know how to water ski? You got one guy in the whole crowd knows how to water ski. Wow. <laughs> Can I say, y'all need to get out more. <laughs> All right. Listen to this. Can I just tell you this? I, I can water ski a little bit. I haven't done it in a long time. Can I tell you, you know how the best way to water ski is? The best way to learn to water ski? It's not online. It's behind a line. <laughs> I mean, it, it, a, a real line. By, on a boat. Behind a boat. All right. So the best way, listen, the best way to learn how to water ski is actually in the water. All right? Not YouTube. Okay? <laughs> now here's what we do. Is that we try to make disciples without actually being in ministry. Without actually helping anybody, doing anything for anybody. So I, I, would, I, would, I would hope and pray that everybody in this room was in a small group. But I would hope and pray that every small group wasn't just meeting inside, that you were going outside. You see, he wanted people to be with him so that they could, he could change them, and so that he could care for them, and so that he could coach them. 
But then here's the last thing. Is that he wanted them to be with him so that he could build a launch pad to commission them. So that he could build a launch pad to commission them. This is so important. Guys, listen. Hope you get this. I'm almost done. Listen to this. Jesus did not create community for the sake of community. Jesus created community to accomplish a mission of making disciples. I cannot tell you how many people get into community and love being in community so much that community becomes the end product. No, 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 no. If you have experienced Christ-like community, the reason that you are in community is so that you can create more communities. So that you can keep spreading the Gospel. You see, Jesus used the small group as a vehicle to change the world. It was ne- it, Listen, if, if the original disciples that we just read about in chapter 3 of Mark or in the book of Acts, if that community had only existed for itself, then none of us would be here, none of us would know Christ, and I wouldn't even be talking about it today. But that community had a purpose. That community had a purpose to reach more people, to grow more people, to be able to spread the mission of making disciples to places that it had never been. Honestly, the group of 12 was really just the beginning of a movement that would spread across the globe. The goal was never that they would stay together. The goal from the beginning is that they would go out and start more communities. (laughs) You see, here's what he said. I chose 12 that they might be what? What what did we say? With Him? So that He might, two words? Send them. With Him to what? Send them. Listen to this story. I'm sure it's changed since I first heard it, but it's a great story. There was a lady, housewife, named Jean Nidich, I believe is how you pronounce it. Guess where she lived? New York City. How about that? A little slice of home here. Jean Nidich lived in New York City. She was a housewife. She wanted to lose weight. She went to the New York Health Department. She asked for a diet. They gave her a diet. She went back. She failed miserably. She said, this is horrible. Can't lose weight. Just want to lose 30, 40 pounds. She decided she would go to some friends. So she invited six other housewives over to her house. They used the same diet. This time, guess what happened? They got results. They lost weight. Why? They had community. The right pathway leads you to what? Right destination. Started encouraging each other, holding each other accountable, challenging each other, and start getting results. So here's what happens. So this little group, this woman, this little movement, 30-something years later, 30-something years later, involves over 1 million people in over 250,000 meetings in over 25 different countries around the world. Anybody know what it's called? Weight Watchers. What we could do with the Gospel of Jesus Christ if we were only in a pathway community you know every time we preach God's word in our church in Noonan we believe that there needs to be a response to that Jesus said don't just be hearers be what be doers and I don't know where you are I don't know what's going on in your world Here's what I do know. God never meant for you to be alone. And so I'm going to ask you today, are you ready to commit to community? 
maybe for you, listen to this, maybe for you, it just means being committed to being here every week. Maybe for you, this, the first place, the easiest place to start is a large group. And if you haven't made that commitment, I'm going to ask you today, will you commit to that? Will you commit to being here every week? Now, there'll be, pro- there'll be things you can't control. That's okay. But if you can control it, you'll be here. And then my second question would be this. If you've already committed to being here, would you commit to being in a small group? Would you commit to being in a circle, not just a row? Would you nail that down to, with God today? I'm going to give you a chance to do that. Let's bow together. Every head bowed, every eye closed. So I'm going to pray a simple prayer. I want to ask you to pray this prayer with me. If it's the desire of your heart to really say, God, I want to be obedient to you. I want your plan for my life. Then why don't you just say this prayer right where you are. Just say, dear Jesus, I need you. And I want to be committed to the right path for my life. And I know that means community. And so God, give me the strength. Give me the courage to take the steps I need to take to be on the path to community. God, I commit myself to you today afresh and anew. I pray, God, that you give me the strength to do what I need to do to obey you. God, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit. And thank you, God, that you put me here in this place today. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.